on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Melanin Money Show. And this one is very, very special. Uh, we got two phenomenal guests on, one who I've had the pleasure of knowing personally, first and foremost, but interviewing on my previous show, The Uncensored Podcast, in the heart of the pandemic. And here we are in 2022, and, and arguably, you know, it's still a little pandemic-esque, right? So glad to have you back. Glad to see you guys are safe and healthy and have released a whole book. I think it's actually a full circle moment because I believe on that podcast, you guys mentioned uh, that you were in preparation of launching a book and guys, they do what they say they're going to do. The yeah. book is out. So with no further ado, let's welcome Julie and Kirsten to the show. How are you guys? Thank you. Good, it's, man. it's good to be back. A lot has changed. Yes. Absolutely. And at the same time, not much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot has changed. I mean, I, at the time I, I was uh, not a parent, right? Now yeah, I am a whole, daddy whole daddy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Five-month-year-old legend. Um, and now we have also have evolved the Melanin Money platform and doing a lot of exciting things. But we're here to talk about you guys and this phenomenal book that you guys have wrote, uh, Cashing Out. So uh, for those listeners who have not tapped in yet, which if you haven't, please make sure you tap in. This is a phenomenal book. And just uh, what they stand for in general is, is just amazing. But for those who have not tapped in yet, could you keep, please tell us a little bit about what inspired uh, the idea to write this book in the first place, right? Because offline, before we hopped on, we talked a little bit about the fact that, I mean, through blogging and video content and so many other ways to kind of get your message out, writing a book is, is something that at this point is a little bit nostalgic and just really, really impactful. So what made you guys decide to uh, make that commitment to write such a phenomenal book? I think it's the book that we wanted to read. It's it's the book that, it's the advice that I needed. There were still um, myths that I believed about America, work culture, wealth building that needed to be addressed. And the main one that we were seeing in conversations with our friends and family over the last couple of years was this myth that meritocracy was gonna save us. That if you just worked hard, if you got the good job, if you got the position with high visibility, the team that means something, you got the gig at the company that's a blue chip stock, then that would be the answer. And what we've learned from our research, what the data suggests is that that doesn't do what you think it will, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not the game that you can win. And so what cashing out was intended to do was to change the, the narrative around what it means to win in a career. We used to think that, again, it was getting this big job, but now in this economy, winning is actually knowing when you're ahead and being able to walk away on your own terms. And so we wrote it to be a guidebook, a financial guidebook, a career guidebook for anyone who's participating in the new economy. Imagine yeah. all the rules have changed. So imagine if you're still operating under the playbook that your parents taught you, you're kind of setting yourself up for, for a disappointment. I don't want to say failure, but certainly disappointment. And so right. this is really just meant to be like that moment in history that says, no, the rules have changed. Here's the new way to do it. Yeah. And even, and even beyond that, what you guys did a great job of contextualizing in the book is not only have the rules changed on a macro level, but in a more nuanced way for us, right? Like we've never necessarily, we've always been at a disadvantage, right? And so the way you guys just really were able to speak to that, you said some really, really powerful things in the book. Um, and, and I don't want to misquote quote Julian, but you said something around almost like detaching your uh, like your your belief, right? And then like your how you feel about this country. Like you can like love America, but also not necessarily love how we're yeah. treated. Right? I, I was like, whoa, like that was <laughs> amazing. Or was it, I know it's one day I can't, because y'all went chapter for chapter <laughs> in the book. Cause I also listened, I, I was so good. I read it and then listened to the audio book. Um, but I know one of y'all said it, right? And <laughs> yeah. it was an amazing concept that I think it really forces people to like wrestle with because as Black culture, like our, for a lot of us, you know, our religion and our faith is like the bedrock of how we make decisions and how we see the world. And it's just like, okay, true. No one's knocking that. But if you're going, if you're going to live in America, <laughs> you know, you got to understand how this works. So can you kind of unpack that a little bit? I thought that was a really, really important point in the book. So actually, I'm going I'm to pass that bar back to Kirsten. Because that, was, <laughs> yeah. that was hers. I, I, and I can bring you back to the con today we had the conversation. I mean, even just that section in the book, was like a day and a half of just thought work and really going back and forth. And, and, and to your point, like finding the exact moment in the book where we really kind of wanted to, you know, quote unquote, go there to yeah. address like the depth of our faith and how oftentimes it works in conflict mm -hmm. with what we're actually trying to accomplish. And 
in, in full transparency, we still did not fully go there, right? Like yeah. that is another <laughs> book. Yeah. That's That's another that is another book. Listen, I got to get a couple more stacks behind me before I'm willing to take You got to really on. not care. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was, I was like, you're making your whole feature on that, on that chapter. Right. Yeah. Somebody can do it, but like, not me. Like, I'm comfortable right now, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not willing to bet it all to, like, have the army. <laughs> the yeah, yeah. Put it all on black, literally, right? <laughs> we, we ain't even nah. all the way there yet, but, like, that was really Kirsten's point, and I think it's actually, you know, also part of, of like, how she was brought up, right? I mean, we were yeah. both sort of brought up in into in the church but it was something that we definitely wanted to like do our part to unpack a little bit yeah i think i'm trying to remember the line it was something like you can benefit from america's systems without wholly endorsing her flaws yeah and then there was another part that said you can absolutely have faith in your god without having faith in your country and Mm -hmm. these are two ideas that i don't know that we've really dealt with and grappled with because we tend to take the faith that we have in our god our churches our communities and just kind of blanket apply it despite the fact that we've been disappointed yeah, for right. decades going on yeah. centuries. So yeah. yeah, it was important for me to, to call that out because as someone who was raised in the church, it was something that got in the way for a long time. I was endlessly optimistic about my chances, my career ambitions, how I would resolve problems. And yeah. I needed to be able to separate those. Yeah. And the only thing I would add to that is like, even for me, it, it was really just a standpoint of like, even going beyond faith and also just thinking about ancestry. I think we take so much pride in our strength and our history and our resilience oh, yeah. almost to a fault. Like yeah. we feel like mm-hmm. we, we should be able to do backbreaking work and actually we shouldn't complain about it because it's nothing compared to what our ancestors did. Mm-hmm. And, you know, listen, I've only been working on, on a grind for like 15, 20 years, but like, it's safe to say like it has not worked for the vast majority of us you know what I mean so we really got to start thinking and acting differently and we wanted to make sure that we we dove into that a little bit absolutely absolutely and and Gia we had an episode on that a a couple podcasts ago about like you know finding the balance between you know understanding that in America we're treated a certain way and that we should hold some space and some empathy for that but on the other side of the fence, it's like, how long are you going to complain about it before you go do something about it, right? Hello? So, Hello? It, you know, so, so I, it's, it's a fine line. And for me, um, I learned that life is not about what happens to you. It's about how you respond to what happens to you, right? So so for me, I, you know, I know that, to your point, there are things that are really, really wrong with this country, especially for us, especially when it comes to finances and trying to make it to the next level. But... Are you gonna wait for them to fix it or are you gonna fix it yourself? So I think a lot right. of people battle with that and 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 kind of see where's that fine line between holding empathy and taking things in your own hands. Yeah, yeah and I think you guys in the book did, did a great job of, of highlighting that in the sense that, okay, well, if there are some challenges that we're seeing, the what we need to do is, and I'm abbreviating this, but get our money right, right? So that we can leverage that as a tool in a in, in power, right? Collective power to have that impact in our communities, right? Because at the end of the day, we realize that money is a tool. Um, But for this next question, uh, it's kind of one of those like asking for a friend question, right? Because I've I've, I've admired you guys up close and from afar um, for for a number of years now. Really, really love the Money on the Table series. And when you think about in the book, how you guys broke down, I think the big three, right? Housing, food, and I think was it transportation, was it your car, is that was it? Mm -hmm. Those three, right? And for me, it's kind of a full circle moment knowing your brand. It's like, okay, you guys created this real high quality content series called Money on the Table where you're having these conversations around around the table, right? Food at home that you're cooking and obviously saving money versus buying that meal out, right? Just those little nuances I was able to catch. But that, that series was produced in Black excellence, if you will, right? Because again... I'm, I'm all for just grabbing your iPhone and hopping on and, and, and talking to the camera. And, but there's another level, which you guys tapped into with that series that I, that I really, really can recognize and appreciate. And so my question for you is in the book, you spoke specifically about this idea of like of black excellence, right. And just like striving to be like the best and like, how, how do you guys reconcile being excellent at what you're doing in your business from an entrepreneurial standpoint while still, I guess, pacing yourself and prioritizing this life of, of, of what's important in life, right? About family and community and the things that you spoke about. How do you guys kind of balance it too? Because even with this book, right? Another thing that took a lot of time and you guys wanted to do an excellent. So how do you guys kind of reconcile with that, that balance of being excellent while still prioritizing the things that matter most? 
So no pun intended, I think that's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> and it's one that I've actually, you know, hoped somebody would, you know, have the courage or even just the willingness to kind of tackle uh, for the last couple of years, right? Like we've been doing this for a couple of years. No one has ever asked yeah. us that question, which to me, I've always felt was pretty obvious, but uh, so thank you for that. Um, I don't have an eloquent answer, <laughs> like a pre-canned speech. So I'm just sort of going off the top of my head. But I think without trying to overcomplicate it, what you're seeing in money on the table and what you're seeing in cashing out, which, you know, to your point is it was a huge lift, like going the traditional route, going mm -hmm. through Penguin Random House. And I'm not saying this to brag, right? But going through portfolio books, like a highly respected imprint, um, the level of production that we put into uh, money on the table is not mm -hmm. just a result of, of um, funding. <laughs> it, it, it's a result of like having the time and, and the willingness to mm. take creative risk. And what a lot of that boils down to is like, you know, I, like I think that a lot, there are a lot of people that do what we do or want to do what we do, but they just don't have the, the, the courage to kind of take creative risk. And I think one of the keys for us was to be able to say, like, what would I want to watch? Like, I know what I'm mm -hmm. in, um, inspired by. And to your point, like, I've heard plenty of people say, oh, just get started. Just turn on an iPhone. Just press record. Um, but I also know that that has, uh, like, like this, this sometimes is whack, right? It's, it's just whack. <laughs> and it can yeah. be discouraging for people. And so when I think about the people that we were specifically trying to reach, uh, their taste levels and what they were, you know, wanting to see. Like, you're not going to go from hopping, from watching like dope stuff on Prime Video or Netflix and then be willing to lower your bar to pay attention to a message that I think is actually relevant for you. And so we wanted to, yeah. you know, it's one thing to say, you know, as, as people in, in, in a place of earned privilege, that so you got to meet people where they are and you break down, a, a, you know, a, a concept in a way that they can understand it works both ways, right? There are certain people that you yeah. want to reach who are, who do have the means, who do have the abilities to do some things. So I got to meet them where they are, right? Like I'm talking to the talented tenth for the most part. I'm trying to meet them where they are. You know what I mean? And so we knew that we had to go there. Um, we know that even like the data behind who actually buys books, more often than not, mm -hmm. we're talking about people who are earning $75,000 or more and college have a educated. college degree, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, yeah, we needed to meet them where they are. So I think that it, the same is true for people um, who, who may not have the means or may not have those types of style or taste preferences. But in terms of how we balance that, um, again, a lot of that comes from just having the freedom to be able to do it. Right? We had the time to, to do right. that. I can afford to say, yeah, I'm going to take a couple of weeks and really think this through. I'm going to get on a call with my mm -hmm. cinematographer and think about where we're going to go. I can take pitch after pitch until I find the right you know, person who's willing to say, all right, yes, I'm willing to break five G's or, or five stacks, excuse me, to help um, fund What's this. What's the melanin money show? You can say five G's. <laughs> yeah. you know, well, it was more than that. It was more than that. Uh, I got you. Because and, and and we knew that yeah. because I was like, yo, like I'm giving you Netflix. That was like the greatest compliment that we would ever get. It was like, yo, man, it should be on Netflix, right? Because that to me yeah. told me that like, all right, wait, you can you can envision this on Netflix. And by the way, like mm -hmm. I feel like it's actually not on that level, but like <laughs> it was still like enough yeah. of a hint for people to be like, oh wow, I could see that. So right. yeah, it was it was really just like having the time and, and the freedom and the willingness to kind of take. The time to yeah. Like What's going on, guys? My name is George Atchampong. I'm Jacqueline Shattuck. And I'm Carter Cofield. And we are the founders of Melanin Money. And the reason why we started Melanin Money is because we know that there's a great disparity when it comes to building wealth among people of color. We have a tremendous mission that we want you guys to join, right? Every single year, we want to help at least 1,000 people improve their net worth by $100,000, which will create $100 million of new black wealth every single year. Can you imagine a hundred million dollars of new black wealth every year? As it stands right now, for every one dollar that a white family has, a black family has a mere 10 cents to match that dollar. We want to increase the wealth in the black community so that we can have equal opportunities. Simply put, we're about closing the wealth gap and it starts with you. So see you inside. Ideas. Yeah. And I think it has a, a multi-pronged impact when you do it that way, right? Because it, it helps, number one, the message is important, right? The, at the end of the day, the concept is we want our message to get to the right people. So then when it's really quality, you're just looking at it in the lineup, it's like, oh, wait, that stands out. 
So mm-hmm. then, you know, you get the mission quicker because it's quality and then people are receiving it, which I think is, was that, which I think is huge. And then one thing that you guys really understand the, from what I can tell from the outside looking in is that who you serve doesn't have to be who pays you. Right. And so it's like, if we're going to put together this high quality, valuable content, let's go get the bag from these businesses and brands who swear, right. That they're down for the cause and we can put out our best work to the people who, 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 who need it most. Right. And so I love that that in and of itself is a creative risk because what you could do is say, well, man, let's go all in on our digital products and let's go all in on how we can monetize our end user today directly right now. Or we can take the creative risk, put out this high production value uh, content and know that because it's quality, we can stand on that. It's going to stand out amongst the noise. And as a result of that, it's going to breed opportunities uh, that are really, really meaningful. So that's just my from an outside looking in perspective. And kudos to you guys, because um, the Internet has made it incredibly easy to go a different route and to stay to have the integrity and the, and the, the impact. Right? I think because I think you can have way more impact doing the way you guys are doing it speaks volumes of the fact of how far you want this message to go. So, so kudos to you. Cause that's my perception from the outside looking in. I think you are 1000% spot on to the, to the, to the point where I'm about to change my passwords. Because <laughs> <laughs> you might've took a peek at my business plan. But, yeah. but what we, what we call it is not even what we call it, but like as a marketer, it's, it's really about knowing the difference between your customer and your consumer. Right. It's two mm. totally different things. And I think people use those terms interchangeably. The people that consume our content aren't my customers, right? My customers are going to be those big banks, these financial institutions, these fintech companies that want to get in front of the people who consume our content, right? But right. the most important part of that is that the type of relationship that we can have with our readers and our viewers and our listeners is totally different because there's no exchange of money there, right? So we can be mm. honest. We can have very real conversations with them. Um, and and there's, there's no sort of crippling or fracturing of the trust there because yeah. the nature of our relationship is almost like, you know, peer to peer or peer to mentee uh, or something mm-hmm. like that, as opposed to like, I'm your guru. I'm here to give you the answers. Like, we want to be a lighthouse, right? Not, not your guru. Mm. I don't want to be anybody's guru. I just want to be the lighthouse. So you want a dope podcast? Boom, I can point them to you. You want a, a book recommendation because mine doesn't answer your question? Great. I can point somebody to you. But my job is to just be the lighthouse and to shine in a way that attracts people who I believe are being um, underserved. And so that's, that's, that's the essence of what we're doing. And that's why we do it the way that we do it. Makes so much sense. And when you said trust, what stuck out for me is that uh, the trust of one leads to the acceptance of many, right? And so your audience trusts you, which because they trust you, they know you're not just about to, you know, for lack of better terminology, slit out your brand, right? To say, oh, well, this company is throwing us some money. We're going to talk. No, they know they trust y'all because of the integrity that y'all demonstrate in your content. So what ends up happening is you guys become, and I mean, this in the most respectful way possible, good gatekeepers, right? Because there's so many people that try to exploit our culture. Yes. Right. And we have a trusted voice that says, hey, we want to tap into your audience. OK, well, let's, let's see what you're talking about first. Then you can bet them out, share with your audience if it makes sense. And in the process, they're the ones paying you, which further allows you to have the impact. So it's it's so necessary and it's so needed. And again, I just I I'm a very perceptive person. And so I can really spot out like folks who are doing it a certain way. And I just really have a lot of respect uh, for the way that you guys are doing it, because at the end of the day, you guys are helping the mission and the cause that I've been this, been near and dear to me for the past 12 years. And so to see people doing it the right way is uh, so refreshing. So um, thank you. as we move on uh, to the next question, uh, you guys, I think, mentioned this concept of flirting with fire, right? And so the fire movement, obviously, the financial independence, retire early movement um, is kind of a component, right, of cashing out, if you will. But I think there's different variations of, of how you can approach it. So can you guys share with us your approach? Because I think I resonate more with the way that you guys approach it than I do living in an RV. Um, <laughs> yeah, for those, yeah, for those of the hundred percent who, don't, who right? don't understand, yeah. like literally putting all your money away so that you can retire at the earliest date possible. But with that comes with sacrificing a, a potential lifestyle that you can live because you're choosing to retire so early. So it's like you're getting to retirement, but the caveat is, are you enjoying the retirement that you're currently in? So I would love to hear your perspective on that. 
Yeah. So flirting with fire was about the, the reactions we had when we first found the fire movement as well. We were we thought of it as like financial X games. It was just very extreme and very white. <laughs> that doesn't mean we couldn't learn from it which is an important lesson right. for anybody who right. encounters something and the first thing that they're like is like what is that right i remember i'm old enough mm -hmm. to remember when veganism had the same challenges when crossfit had the same oh, yeah. when all of these countercultural movements have had similar reactions at first glance but when we embedded ourselves in the community we really started to see the benefit of what they were talking about we were seeing people yeah. who would spend their days doing what they want to do loving couples who didn't hate each other and enjoyed time with their children and spent time in nature and really appreciated the cycles of things would hit be hit with a recession or an emergency but had the perspective because they had all of this time for reflection to put it in the right context of their life and so when we created cashing out it was really just to um reconcile the battle that people have with fire where they feel like they need to choose either the FI side or the RE side mm -hmm. and just say, it can be a blended approach. You can cash right. out of whatever boogeyman you have at the moment. If it's your job, then take a year off, right? Save up enough to take a year off. If it's mm -hmm. an abusive relationship, if it's needing extra domestic care at home via a nanny or a housekeeper, there are things that you can cash out along the way. And if you take it that, if you take that approach, you can eventually whittle your life down to the things that matter the most. And if retirement is your end goal after that, like after you whittled down all the things that like cause friction in your life, if mm -hmm. work is still there and you like it, keep it. If work needs to be getting gone away, then like retire. But it just gives right. you more flexibility. It's more of a practice instead of like an event or a milestone mm -hmm. like fire tends that. to be talked about. It's like get yeah. in relationship with your money, get in relationship with the economies that you participate in and cash out along the way. Know when you win in and cash out and yeah. walk away on your own terms from whatever it is. But but I'll, I'll also add this. <clears throat> there are very few things that I think that I thought were dope in 2012 that I think are so dope right now. Right. <laughs> That's true. Too. The resorts I visited, the clothes I wore, the cars <laughs> I drove, the liquor, all that stuff that I drank, like very few of those yeah. things I, I think stood the test of time. Um, and mm -hmm. I think at some point you got to be a little, a little honest with yourself. And, you know, one of the things that we did, we were in Philly on our book tour and we were talking to um, a group of people who decided to attend. And, and I was asking them, like, go go back to their, their aunts and their uncles' houses and just listen to their stories. Go through the photo album. And you remember all your aunts and your uncles and they had the dope car and they would tell you they had the this and the that. Mm -hmm. But very few of them actually still have right. those things. You know what I mean? And so it's not a matter of, 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 of judging people from wanting or liking nice things, but I do think you need to get those things in perspective. Um, and secondly, I would say a lot of these things are really irrelevant if you have enough income, right? You can do both. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, right. I, you don't always have to make this trade off between, oh, well, right. I'm going to sacrifice, eat ramen, peanut butter, and jelly, and bologna sandwiches to get by so that I can save all this money. Like, if you make enough money, you can actually do both and actually do it quite comfortably. And so, we really just wanted to make sure that our community specifically, uh, whether they took the advice or not, like I, I don't gain, I don't earn a commission on whether or not people <laughs> decide to take a different career path or, or whatever they decide right. to do with money. But we at least wanted to make sure that people knew it was an option for them, yeah. right? Like it was something that we'd yeah. experienced, something that we've done, something that we've seen done. And I felt like um, given what we were seeing in the community, we just wanted to make sure that it was like, hey, this is what we're doing, yo. And it's working. And this is what we like. And right. look, if you don't want to do yeah. it, it's perfectly fine. If you only want to do right. it for a month, if you want to incorporate a no spend Wednesday, yeah. just like you do a meatless Monday, right? at least you now have the tools of what to do with the money that you would have spent, which is, according to the means, $200 a day. <laughs> like, you at least know where to put <laughs> right, it, right. what it can do for you. Like, we're not saying mm -hmm. to jump in. It's not meant to be a cult. So, like, take the pieces that apply yeah. to you, revisit it often. And as you continue to progress, you might realize that things that felt hard a year ago now feel like, oh, why wasn't I doing this? Yeah, that's a fact. That's a fact. Um, so two things I want to say that came out of that is, one, there's this, this ideology that I live by that the value of anything is the amount of life you're willing to trade for it, mm. right? So when you look at the money that you're going to spend, it's like, okay, just really ask yourself that question. I don't care whether you're an entrepreneur or you're a working professional, whatever the case may be, you can, you can pretty much quantify what your time is worth relative to what you're compensated, right? 
So when you're looking at how you spend your money, you can just ask yourself that question, right? Is that car payment $800 or is it 20 hours of my life? Like, and am I cool? And once I have that answer, am I cool with that? Right. If you're cool with this, like, man, I'm getting so much value out of this. I'm still single. The ladies is loving me when I pull up at the stoplight. Then cool. Like you might be getting all the value out of that car <laughs> that you need. Right. But if not, that's just something you got to reconcile with yourself. And it's like, OK, well, hmm, I'm trading a significant portion of my life for this. And so that's something that really kind of woke me up in my decision making along the way. Just like, yeah, that's definitely not worth it. Right. Yeah. Um. And then uh, this is my short term memory kicks in because I had two things and now that second thing has escaped me. So we'll come welcome back to, to that. Fatherhood, brother. <laughs> yeah, welcome, welcome to fatherhood. To fatherhood. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You've just I leveled mean. up. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I, and I got on Crocs right now. So I think I, my, <laughs> me too. My, I've missed another level in, in fatherhood. Um, you guys um, talked about the, the three principles of cashing out in your book, uh, stealth wealth, the black tax, and then the pur- uh, purpose and community, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Um, could you guys uh, touch on that a little bit? Um, because I thought that that was a really good cornerstone uh, of the book in general, especially the stealth wealth piece in, in, in today's society, right? That's, that's a big one for people to be able to really realize. Yeah, stealth wealth is, um, you know, it, it's something that I'd been mindful of, but I really didn't like have a name for it. And then, you know, mm-hmm. I heard it and I was like, oh yeah, I'm stealing that bar. Um, but it's really, you know, if you think about like, or when I think about a lot of my white peers, you know, they, they have these examples of people in their life that are business. So it could be the guy, me, I know this, it's the guy that runs the landscaping business and he's got this entire community on lock. But when you see mm-hmm. him you know, have some dingy car- cargo jeans, uh, cargo shorts, he's <laughs> rolling in a rickety looking pickup truck, you know what I mean? Um, right. but his net worth is about four and a half million, you know what I mean? And it's going to stay in the family because the son has got next, right? We don't have enough examples of that in, in, in the black community. For me, when I think about, uh, black wealth, it's like a story of extremes, we're either telling the story of people who embody the idea of black excellence, or we are telling the opposite end of that, um, people who are just in the, in the depth of poverty. And so what we really mm-hmm. wanted to do is like, yo, there's, there's a whole world in between and we just don't really see a lot of that. And so mm-hmm. we really feel like it's a core element, not just of like cashing out, but even just our personal brand. Uh, and we wanted right. to one, try to embody that a little bit, but then also just encourage people to say like, again, you don't have to, you don't have to do all of these things. Like it's okay to say that you don't like these things. You know what I mean? Like, um, we just want to make sure that people knew that that was um, that that was a thing. Um, did you want to speak to the other two? Sure. Um, or did you just want to you just wanted to go deep? Oh, no, for, for all means, um, you know, I, I, of course, all this nuggets and all this gems and all the wisdom is in the books. You don't have to give it all away. But I did think that that was um, a, a really good point. Some really good points that you guys touched on. And so. I, just had, I just had an encounter of that. What's today? Like, three days ago. Right. So we had like an entrepreneur event in L.A. And a, you know, a couple of my mentors were there, like some high level entrepreneurs and there's some other people in the room that just wanted to hear us talk. And then, you know, I'm seeing like, you know, Rolexes and chains and all that stuff in that room. And then our mentor's mentor walks in the room, right? And like, this guy's probably doing, you know, 20 million, right? A year, right? So he comes in, t-shirt, jeans, pair of Jordans, no watch, no chain, no earring, no bliss, no, nothing. Like the Jordans were the most expensive thing. They, they, he wore them, people wearing them for a little while. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I got them one fresh yeah, out the box. <laughs> yeah, they, they, them one fresh yeah, out the yeah. box. And then you know, he just walks in and, I, and then and you know, my mentor put me to say, he's like, that, yeah, that's my mentor. I'm like, right there? Like, right. Okay, I was like, okay, that's, and it threw me off because I was just, it reminded me of how as a culture, we just expect somebody to look like the money that they have. But once you get to a certain wealth, amount you just like yo, it, i couldn't wear it if i tried you know what i'm saying like so i right. think it's something that we need to you know get unused to seeing and, and comparing what people look like to what, how much they make what's going on guys i'm george i'm jacqueline and i'm carla and we are your money mentors but today we wanted to talk to you about a really special feature financial flicks can you imagine an entire on-demand library of financial content across three main categories wealth building entrepreneurship and personal finance so that you can take your finances to the next level Guys, when you replace entertainment with education, your life will change forever. Imagine replacing one hour of Netflix with one hour of financial flicks. Imagine how much further that can take you to your financial destination. And we have the perfect library for you. Yeah, so if you're ready to financial flicks and chill with us, 
to put more of your energy into education, then join us in the club. We can't wait to see you there. See you there. What's going on, guys? My name is George Atchampong. I'm Jacqueline Shattuck. And I'm Carter Cofield. And we are the founders of Melanin Money. And the reason why we started Melanin Money is because we know that there's a great disparity when it comes to building wealth among people of color. We have a tremendous mission that we want you guys to join. Right? Every single year, we want to help at least 1,000 people improve their net worth by $100,000, which will create $100 million of new black wealth every single year. Can you imagine $100 million of new black wealth every year? As it stands right now, for every $1 that a white family has, a black family has a mere 10 cents to match that dollar. We want to increase the wealth in the black community so that we can have equal opportunities. Simply put, we're about closing the wealth gap, and it starts with you. So, see you inside. What's up, guys? Congratulations on joining Team Black Wealth. But we'd be remiss if we didn't give you a uniform as an official player on the team. So head over to shop.melaninmoney.com and grab your official uniform for Wealth Builders of Color. We'll see y'all at practice. Yeah, I think it's just a product of, of digital and social media. I think it'll be a phase that we go through. I don't think it's just like something that is super unique to our community. There are versions of it everywhere. But I'm hoping that as time passes on and we continue to see the consequences of those choices, that it mm -hmm. becomes more natural to be like, you actually don't need to adorn yourself anymore with all of that stuff, unless you just right. want to. That's a different right. story. Um, but right. going back to the other two pillars, the black tax was really just our attempt to get people to snap out of the rules of thumb that they've been told their entire lives and add this consequence of being a marginalized identity in the United States. So if you mm -hmm. were told that you only need to save 10 to 15 percent, if you were told that housing may be the best single mm -hmm. most important investment that you will ever, ever, ever make, those things have to be reconciled with what actually happens when you get involved in work and when you encounter racism at a structural scale. You need to be saving probably closer to 25%. You need to be extra diligent about what kind of homes you buy in what neighborhoods to make sure that they're appraised correctly and maintained and that property taxes are accounted for as we continue to pass them through generations. There's just things that you have to account for that our white counterparts who come up with these very quick and obvious rules of thumb haven't really had to deal with. And then the third one around community and purpose really boils down to what else money can do for you besides buy you things. Mm -hmm. Movements, social progress, all of these things require funding. And if we are waiting on a government institution or a corporate institution to fund our freedom, our liberation, we're gonna be waiting for a long time. And so mm -hmm. when we talk about uh, community and purpose, we talk about the role that the anonymous don donors paid the role that the anonymous donors played in the civil rights movement and making sure that our heroes were bailed out of jail. We tell the story about Martin Luther mm -hmm. King and he expected to stay in jail for a week and was bailed out after a couple of days by some anonymous donor. Even now, right. when we look at HBCUs and student loans, they're being paid by anonymous donors. When we look at uh, politics, Roe versus Wade, a lot of those Planned Parenthood donations are coming from people with means. And so if you want to be able to advance the society that you, uh, to advance the society that you actually want to see and participate in, you might need to have a little extra on the side <laughs> to make sure that you can fund those people that are doing their grassroots work. And yeah. so when you take all of those things into consideration, it's meant to just, I know a lot of people have uh, hangups around wealth building. They feel like getting rich is an inherently selfish act. They feel like, you know, I'm not into all the bling or whatever. It just means to add more purpose behind the reason why any of us are doing all this stuff. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And I want to, I want to go one layer down on the first one with the stealth wealth. So quick, quick question. What do you guys feel like is the, well, let me get some context here. So uh, there's a, another friend of ours named Justin Owens who has a brain. You've probably seen the shirts, uh, rappers, crossed out athlete, entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Basically saying that there's another path to, you know, to being successful. Yeah. So my question is, when we think about the stealth wealth ideology, I think what he's what he's trying to articulate here is there's we have the ability as entrepreneurs to show that there's other paths to success. So what is that balance between showing that success, right? Whatever that might look like. Right. While also still not feeling like you have to show it in ways that people typically interpret 
you know, that you have wealth. I think there is a balance there because we're now giving the other generation a way of, of saying like, man, I don't have to be a rapper or athlete or whatever. I can be this person. I can be that person. But how are we showcasing that? Are we just showing it through our work? Are we like from you guys' vantage point, um, how 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 are you inspiring the person who wants to be the next Kirsten and Julian who want to be rich and regular, right? Um, is it through your work? Is it through your content? I'm just genuinely curious. That's such a great question. And I think for me, it's through my connection to other people and through access, right? Those are the, the status symbols that I'm trying to show what's possible with because a lot of us are used to paying for those things. But if you are, if you live among people who have the same mindset as you, you can walk up to a, a restaurant in town at one o'clock on a Tuesday and you know who's sitting in that bar? People who don't have to be at work, right? You can go to gym at 1130 at night on a Wednesday, and you know who's there? People who don't have the same lifestyle as you. And so there's different ways just by living your life in a non-conventional way that you're able to get into the same rooms and meet different types of people and connect with different people from around the world without necessarily having to buy into it through accelerated education or um, you know, private clubs mm-hmm. and, and social groups. There's just a different, it's through lifestyle yeah, for me. Yeah, no, that makes, makes total sense. And it's almost like when I think about you guys' brand, it's almost like you guys are like the intellectual Robin Hoods, right? So it's like, what I, what I mean by that- <laughs> I like that. <laughs> what, what, what I mean by that is like, you guys, it, it, you don't necessarily have a struggle story, right? You guys were climbing a corporate ladder. You were doing great things. You were making solid income individually and collectively. But even in that, realize like, mm, like this isn't this isn't the path, right? And so your message does resonate a little bit differently because it does kind of speak to that, you know, jet setting consultant who's making money or the person, the pharmaceutical sales guy who's making 250, but like, yeah, making fast money, I think as you guys put it, but Mm -hmm. am I really building well? And I think there are enough of this, right? I.e. the spending power methodology that you speak about, enough of us that are making it, but what are we doing with it? Are we just using so much of that money to show that we got it, right? And then we look up 10 years down the road and we're like the the gentleman who said he'll he'll get his stuff together one day, right? So- (laughs) Um, it's like we're cosplaying wealth. Yeah. 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 Because we struggled with that. We were like, how is a world where our spending power is growing, but our net worth is declining? What does that mean? What does that say? How do you reconcile those two metrics going in opposite directions? And I think you're right. I think we're just, we're so inexperienced in what to do. I mean, not to no fault, not to no fault, to little fault of our own. We weren't able to participate in the same asset classes as our white counterparts for hundreds of years. So we're learning but with the digital divide, we're already 10 years behind and we've been 10 years behind for the last 20 years. So there's a lot of catch up that we have to do and a lot of unlearning and a lot of um, filtering that we have to do as people learn to operate within these spaces with yeah. integrity and with with um, a bit of, it's not caution, but at least risk management, like risk assessment. Right. No, you guys definitely raised the bar. And I just want to give you your flowers, you know, Aww. why why you why you can smell them, because uh, again I get a chance to to see me, me and Carter both, right? We get a chance to to be exposed to all sorts of financial educators, financial advisors, you know, people who are just taking up space. And and, and what I do appreciate is that I'd rather the conversation be happy. I mean, there is nuance and there's context, and and God knows during the pandemic people were making all sorts of terrible decisions, chasing meme stocks and things of that nature. But what I can at least appreciate is that it's creating conversation. And I think cream always rises to the top. Um, and so, you know, those messages who need to be heard will be heard. And you guys is one, are one of those messages that need to be heard. So guys, if you have not, if this podcast up until this point has not encouraged you to number one, follow their work, rich and regular. Um, and number two, we, I, real, real quick tangent, you guys, you said you couldn't think of a word for stealth wealth. I think rich and regular is that, right? Like <laughs> that is, that is it, right? But- Thank you. Um, I own the trademark, them. so I hope you're right. <laughs> what you say? I hope you're right. I got the trademark. Hey, man, <laughs> I, I believe it. Um, and so follow them, tap in with everything they got going on content wise. And then number one, get the book, right? Cashing Out is an eloquently written book. Uh, it just really gives the the cultural context necessary for people who look like us to understand how they can win the game despite, you know, the things that are against us, right? And still have a really, really viable chance at doing so. So uh, kudos to you guys for the work that you have done, that you will continue to do, for the bar that you will continue to raise. 
Um, and, 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 and Julian, you're a great cook. So hopefully I get a chance to make it to the table. Uh, I mean, y'all should cook pepper. together. You're a great cook as well. Yeah, yeah I, do, oh, I do what I can. You know, so I do what I can. I've seen a little, little, little song. <laughs> we can match. Um, but this is, this has been really, has been, has been a pleasure. And, and what's been on, ironic in our last kind of three episodes is, you know, you kind of expect the podcast to go like the, the full hour, hour and 15. Well, we're realizing, man, those people who really have those but just those concise, valuable gems. Like it don't, it don't even take all that. Like y'all are y'all are giving us everything we need to nourish our audience in in, in, a, in a relatively short period of time. So we are grateful for your time. We know you guys are are on a, a really big uh, run with sharing this book to the world. We'll definitely drop all the links in the show notes so that people can grab. It. As a matter of fact, I want to give I want to gift this book to three people. Right. So if you leave a review, honest review on you know of this episode on Apple Podcasts. We're going to pick three of those reviews and I'm going to give three books to three people because it needs to be read. I read it and listened to the audio book and I'm a new dad and have a lot of other stuff going on. So that should tell you everything you need to know. I actually, I think when I got it, I got it the same day the Drake album came out. And, and so, it, well, admittedly, it was, I was going to say it was a little easy to like stay focused on the book and not listen to the album. That's, that's, that's no shame. I chose, I chose Damn. cashing out over continuing to listen to the Drake album that day. So, I mean, I love Drake. I love Drake. I, I love the album. It's eclectic. It's different, but I chose cashing out and I got the book on the same day. It's the Drake. So that's so. a hell of an endorsement. Thank you. I was that, that's, that's, that's one right there. Yeah. yeah. And, actually, no, and it took me a couple of listens, but there's a couple of songs on there. I can, I can, I can see the rooftop and the bees of vibe. <laughs> um, but before we go, I would like to really quickly touch on, I meant to touch on it earlier. Um, you guys kind of had like an awakening or an epiphany moment on the honeymoon, right? Um, was it, was it in Jamaica? Is that where you guys were? South Africa. South Africa. No, I'm sorry, South Africa. I don't know why I said Jamaica. Um, South Africa. I do want you guys just to talk briefly about that before we go, because I think uh, what that will do is it will just kind of open other people's eyes. Number one, just creating that time for yourself along the way. We talked about, you know, creating less friction in your life and, you know, how to, and then one, when you look up one day, do you still not want the job? But basically you guys, you know, had a, a moment to travel and enjoy yourselves. And that's what created that, I guess, that environment. So like, if there's any kind of encouraging words that you can either one speak to that epiphany that happened in that moment or opportunities that you think people can take to create that space, to be able to actually think right in terms of like, what is your ideal life going to look like? I think that's half the battle. I think people are just, moving so fast they don't even have enough time to slow down to even embrace the ideology of what a different life could look like yeah so i'm I'm gonna actually try to paint two pictures for you but i'm I'm gonna start with that story so we were on our honeymoon um and there's so many layers to it but first of all um we got married in early september we didn't take our honeymoon until like late october why because we were gung-ho hardcore corporate travel you know, all about it, trying to squeeze in. I think we squeezed in about six business trips Mm -hmm. in between our wedding and our honeymoon because we just didn't want to put, put it down. Right. We would get in the bag and we didn't want to like blow the sort of momentum that we had. Uh, But we spent two weeks uh, in, in South Africa. It was a bucket list trip. Um, And we found ourselves in Cape town, one of the most beautiful places in the world, literally, to my right is the the ocean to my left is just like clouds spilling over mountains like absolutely gorgeous we're drinking wine on a patio and that work itch kicked in and instead of like enjoying the moment we got sucked into email and we were on our phones and got saw this email and we found out that the executive at uh, of our department who hadn't even been there a year came in guns blazing, ready to sort of change the world. And we were at the heart of it, basically chucked the deuces and was quitting Mm -hmm. with a BS excuse, right? Uh, And then we spent the next couple of hours, one, talking about work, but then ended it being really, really frustrated that we couldn't keep this very simple promise to ourselves, which is to like completely unplug. Like we waited six weeks to take this trip and we'd already wasted like three to four hours just like talking about work and all the BS. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was the first indication that work was a really, really big problem. And if we can't even sort of kick the habit on our honeymoon in one of the most beautiful places in the world, then this is a problem. Mind you, the other reason why we wanted to leave and go on the other side of earth was because it was in the middle 
of one of those crazy election periods, which has now just become the norm. The norm. Right. right. But what we were trying to escape back then was just the constant onslaught of media and craziness, which we now know was like Russian bots and all that shit. Right. <laughs> it was just crazy. But we were just completely addicted to work. We didn't call it that at the time. We were just like, ah, man, this is get in the bag. Fast forward four, no, three years later, our son is born. I've never told this story before. Exclusive. Exclusive story. <laughs> and, I, and, and I don't I'm, even know reason. And I'm also going to say trigger warning for new parents, right? And I apologize if I even crack up. My mom was at my house watching our son, which is what she did. I think it was like every Tuesday and Thursday, like basically my mom and her mom, they would sort of take shifts shortly mm-hmm. after, he, after he was born. I think it was about six months after he was born. And she happened to go into the room where he was, picked him up. And as she was walking out, she tripped over the comforter on the comforter and the baby fell. And I got a call from her saying, I need you to come home. I fell. But she was in such a panic, I couldn't even understand what she was saying. Mm -hmm. But I just knew I needed to book it and head home. Sent Kirsten, go home immediately. Drive whatever you're doing, let's go. I get home, fire trucks there, ambulances there, like all kinds of stuff. Thankfully, for anyone that's like hearts racing, our son was okay. But my mom, when she fell, she hit the dresser um, and literally... um, she has a, a gash on her face now, um, like Four like inches. like yeah, like wow. look like 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 oh boy, I forget his name, Michael Williams or whatever that passed away a couple of years ago, Omar from The Wire. Oh yeah 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 yeah. She ended up getting stitches all over her face, and I needed to figure things out. I was like, you stay here with our son, make sure she he's okay. I'm gonna hop and fo- uh, follow the ambulance to go to the hospital, and <clears throat> even in the hospital. And on the way to the hospital at red lights, I found myself like trying to cancel meetings and trying to respond to emails, just trying to stay abreast of things so that I didn't drop the ball. And I knew at that point that this was a problem, right? And we don't call this addiction. We don't have a word for this yet. The Japanese have a word for this, right? Yeah. They have a word for this overwork, people who are completely obsessed. It is core to the identity. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they lose it, they lose themselves and it leads to suicide or death, right? Mm-hmm. United States of America, this is not, we're not that far from it. And I can say as someone who was there. And so I say all of that to say, these are some of the moments, the personal moments in our lives that we've gone through that have fundamentally made us rethink our relationship with money and work. Mm-hmm. Because here I am and I'll stand up just like all the executives that I would have called fake saying that family is the number one thing that's important to them, even though they travel 70% of the time and they never get to see them. Here I was, and I really wasn't that different, right? Like I was on my honeymoon uh, with my wife and I couldn't stop checking my email. My son was in my mother's arms when he fell and she caught a gash on her face. He you know, could have easily been could've him. Easily you know? been mm-hmm. him, right? Um, and here I was still, like not in the moment, but like checking email, just trying to bang things out so that I don't create any disruption when it's time for me to go back to work. And so all of that to say, I know most people likely won't go through those types of traumatic experiences to trigger them, but it really doesn't matter what you go through. Like we all right. really got to take a <clears throat> step and think about what we're doing to ourselves, what impact this obsession has in our relationships, on our abilities to parent. And I think on a larger scale, like our abilities to contribute to the culture. And so that's, that's, that's sort of, the underlying motivations, not just behind the book, but also what we do is really about quality of life. And so um, I just wanted to share that because like, it's, it's real. And I know, I know the grind is real. I know the bag is out there, but if you're doing that and George, I know you know this well, right? If you're doing this to the, to the detriment of your health and your overall wellness, you're completely wasting your time. You're completely missing. And so, um, yeah. Well, guys, man, I'm glad I, I, I was I was going to try to go the, you know, traditional route of like not asking an additional question once you're kind of wrapping up. But I'm glad that, that that question was on my spirit. And I'm glad I asked because that was a, a, a heck of a way to close the episode. So thank you guys so much for your time. Um, this was a phenomenal uh, episode. And guys, go grab the book, tap in with the Julian and Kirsten. And we look forward to all the great things that you guys are going to continue to do. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you,
Thank you. Until next time, guys. Peace. Peace.